so we are from Civis Analytics. We brought our whole squad. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what we're here to today to talk to you about is a project we worked on with an organization in the city of New York. Um, what we were trying to do with them is help figure out where people were eligible for certain benefits and weren't taking advantage of them. So we'll dive into that a little bit. Um, we can also reintroduce ourselves. Um, my name is Kelly Kraft. I'm a senior applied data scientist at Civis. I'm Advik Kumar, an applied data scientist at Civis. Thanks. And I'm Ola Tepchevska. I'm also an applied data scientist. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a little bit about us and the organization we were working with. Um, so Civis was formed out of the Obama 2012 analytics uh, like department. Uh, so we worked uh, on the reelect campaign. We had a big analytics team, about 50 people. Um, and we kind of worked across the campaign to try to figure out ways where we could influence the strategy and make sure that we were targeting the right voters, um, providing the right messages to the right people, and saving money where we could um, by placing ads correctly and that sort of thing. Um, and so then our, our CEO and founder, as well as some of our early members of Civis, were all on the Obama analytics team in 2012. But we've moved on from politics. Uh, we're still doing politics, but we're also trying to apply our data science methods and products across other industries. So nonprofit groups, um, government, we're working uh, with uh, the, the media team of the 2020 census, um, with the city of New York, we also have some corporate clients. Um, so trying to figure out ways that we can apply what we've learned in the campaign and since then, uh, to help these organizations operate more efficiently. Uh, for this project specifically, we are working with the Robin Hood Foundation, which is a really large anti-poverty organization in New York City. Um, so what they do is they want to find um, organizations that are working on the ground to help lift people out of poverty. So they provide grants to these uh, groups on the ground. Um, and last in the last year, they invested over $130 million um, in the city of New York. So what they came to us for our help with was that they wanted to figure out um, where people were eligible for the earned income tax credit and where people were eligible for um, food stamps and weren't taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, so SNAP and the earned income tax credit are actually two of the most effective anti-poverty programs in the United States, um, but there is a gap of people who are eligible but aren't participating, so that's about 20% of those folks. Um, so that was the goal for this project, was to figure out where those participation gaps were in the city of New York um, and understand who those eligible, non-participating individuals are, um, and then find a way to connect them uh, with Robin Hood and the organizations on the ground. Um, so there's a couple of challenges that we'll talk a little bit about, but uh, this is a group of people that it's hard to find data about. So you know, we know who we know roughly the number of people who participate in these programs, and we know um, based on criteria who should be eligible. But we don't have a list of like these participating families. We don't have a list of these eligible non-participating individuals. Um, and a lot of the things, a lot of the data sources we were working with, which we'll talk about, uh, were at a different level. So we were looking at specific neighborhoods in New York, um, but we had access to data that was maybe state level or you know, we could look at national trends, but we had to kind of figure out a way to apply that to a geography that would be useful for Robin Hood. Yeah. <laughs> so we combined a different set, a uh, large set of tools and data sources to answer this question. To calculate and figure out where people are eligible but not participating in the program, we started by taking participation data um, that the IRS releases for the earned income tax credit and that one of Robin Hood's partner foundations in New York releases for food stamps. Uh, we combined that with eligibility data to estimate the overall size of the eligible population. We used data that the census releases publicly um, about American communities in a survey called the American Community Survey there. Um, we also rolled in a lot of New York City specific data, so things like 311 uh, calls, uh, locations of benefit centers and things like that to help sharpen our uh, inference in these particular neighborhoods. We were able to combine a lot of these in a platform, um, a data modeling and use platform that we uh, develop and use internally, uh, and that allowed us to combine sor uh, data sources at different levels and funnel it through uh, different stages of our workflow. So once we collected our data sources, we came up with a series of direct estimates for non-participation uh, for these different programs in New York. And we did that by taking uh, these, uh, the eligibility requirements for each program and applying them directly to data that the census releases about these communities. Uh, we did that in R, uh, and we scripted a little bit of that with our platform as well. So what this gave us was a starting point, an estimate of what we thought, uh, of where we thought um, the participation gaps were in New York City. Uh, but we thought we could do one better than just that direct estimate. 
Uh, and to incorporate a lot of the information about New York City specifically, we'd built in a second modeling step uh, to refine those estimates based on data outside the American Community Survey that was more specific to New York City. And that's where our platform really helped us out in terms of uh, building a series of models, uh, quality control for these models and, and things like that, that allowed us to focus more on the conceptual questions um, and structuring the entire workflow in a way that was helpful to our client. So let's talk a little bit about how we read eligibility criteria out of the census and came up with our direct estimates. For simplicity, we'll focus on the earned income tax credit, though our process for SNAP food stamps is similar to this. So the ACS is this large survey that the census administers every year to about 1% of the US population. Uh, it gives us detailed information about people uh, and the households that they lived in. The two catches are first, the data is anonymized. So as Kelly was saying, it's not tied to specific people or specific households in a way that you can re-identify people. Um, so it's released with these uh, you know, random IDs attached to these records. And it's released at a geographic level called the Public Use Microdata Area, or PUMA. So in addition to being majestic beasts, uh, pumas are geographies that contain at least 100,000 people. Um, they're built from census tracts, and they're statistical geographies that the census uses uh, to maintain consistency with its sampling and survey procedures year over year. So to give you an idea of what pumas look like, uh, I'm pretty sure we are currently in this puma in uh, Chicago. Pumas tend to map to groups of neighborhoods. So the puma we're in is a combination of the loop, south loop, and river north. Uh, so it's a combination of neighborhoods, and that tends to apply for other parts of the city as well. Uh, but one of these difficulties is then taking data that's released at this geography and combining it with data that's released at zip code levels, at county levels, uh, when all those pieces might not align entirely. So this is what ACS data looks like. This is the information we have about people that live in each Puma. We have a serial number that ties people to specific households, and then we have detailed information that people reported uh, to the Census Bureau, including their age, different types of income, uh, some information about how they're related to each other, and so on. Uh, you don't need to focus on the specifics of this information. We just wanted to give you an, an idea of the structure of the data we're working with. So EITC eligibility depends on a series of facts about you and your family. Depends on your income, depends on how many, whether you're married, depends on whether you have kids, and a few other things. So what we do to read this information out of the ACS is we split the data into households as identified by a household flag in the data. And then we identify subunits within each household, people we think are married to each other, who we think their kids are, uh, their total income for each unit, and so on. So we directly apply um, program logic to these households and say, what is the income? Uh, how many kids does this married couple have? Are they eligible for the, the earned income tax credit? The catch is the EITC eligibility criteria are very detailed, um, and the ACS does not ask about information at that level of detail. Uh, so for example, you, uh, for someone to be your qualifying child for the earned income tax credit, they have to be either a, uh, related to you by blood or by legal ties. And that's not necessarily what people will report to the census. That's not perfectly captured information there in the uh, American Community Survey. So what we've shown you here is that from the get-go, if we're trying to, re to read eligibility out of the uh, American Community Survey, we're not going to get all the information we need. And this is one of our motivations for building modeled estimates on top of our direct estimates, is that we think direct estimates can't do the job perfectly, and we can supplement them and improve them by incorporating other pieces of information. So the other thing that we do is we try to validate our model, our direct estimates, against external data sources where possible. So one of the things that we do to calculate uh, EITC eligibility uh, is calculate the adjusted gross income for each family member. Your adjusted gross income is a combination of different income types. Uh, depends on like 15 lines of your 1040 form. Um, and what we do is we compare the average income that people make in our model from the ACS with data that's released by the IRS at the zip code level. So we say, among three key income brackets where people could be eligible for these programs, what does our average person make compared to the average filer that the IRS releases? And we find that in general, over years for our model, we're able to track income pretty well for people who make $24,000 to $74,000. Uh, if you look at these points, they line up at about 95%. So the people in our model are earning slightly less 
uh, than the typical person in the, uh, that the IRS reports, but we don't think it's a large enough amount uh, to throw our estimates off significantly. What we do notice, though, is that our estimates are noisy, but pr roughly in the right ballpark, for people who earn $1 to $24,000. So in the bottom income bracket, there's a lot of noise in reported income to the ACS, and we think there are a couple of other factors going into this as well. But basically what this diagnostic told us is that our income model, while good, is far from perfect, and we can probably improve these estimates by adding a modeling step, right? So this is our second um, motivation for modeling. It's not just that the criteria are hard to read, but our best reading of the criteria isn't where we want it to be. So I'll pass the things to Ola. Thanks. Um, so like Advik mentioned, our next step was modeling. And basically, we used the features that we had collected from public sources as well as from these open data sources, the New York City Open Data Portal and partners of the Robin Hood Foundation, to construct a modeling file where the dependent variable, the thing that we were interested in predicting, was that direct estimate of participation. Um, so that estimate was basically just the ratio of the number of people that we had from reported sources participating in a given program or tax units in the case of EITC, divided by the number of families uh, or individuals that, that we estimated were eligible from the ACS. Um, and we fit a model on top of that to basically um, improve our estimates and bring in a lot of this additional data. Um, we did this in two steps. So our first step uh, was a lasso model, so a regularized linear regression, where we were trying to identify which features were most predictive for this particular problem. Um, and because we had such rich data from our commercial data, from uh, these additional data sources that we brought in, uh, we weren't sure exactly which of those hundreds of features would be most predictive, and we didn't want to overfit. Um, after we had selected features uh, using that lasso model, we fit, uh, fit a multi-level Bayesian model to actually come up with our ultimate participation rates. Um, and what this allowed us to do is incorporate uh, changes that were happening at the tract level, at the Puma level, um, and over four years of, of time in our data to be able to come up with much more precise, uh, less variable estimates of what we thought the actual non-participation was. Um, and in practice, this turned out to do the thing that we had hoped it would, which is that it brought our most extreme um, point estimates down closer to the median. Um, and we think uh, that is both an indication of adjusting for some of those errors in the ACS, but also controlling for the fact that some of those geographies were really small and there was just inherently a, lo a lot of noise in the survey estimates. Um, so we handed Robinhood a series of Puma level estimates of uh, communities in New York where they should target their outreach, but New York City is about 55 Pumas total, so it still wasn't at a level of granularity where they could identify the subway stops or particular intersections where they should be doing outreach. Um, and they were interested really in doing direct uh, canvassing to individuals, working with partner organizations in the community, um, and really getting as granular as possible into specific ethnic communities or um, you know, immigrant communities, reaching out to people through different channels. Um, and so a question that they had for us at this stage was, can we drill all the way down to the track level, um, which would get us into you know, several thousand observations in the city of New York as opposed to 55? And this was a challenge for us because our, uh, the data that we observed, the administrative data about participation, really came in at the Puma level or had been rolled up to the Puma level. Um, and we didn't have a direct modelable way of getting at track level information. We couldn't get ACS eligibility at the track level. Um, so we had to do some creative thinking here. Um, and we tried a bunch of things um, in consultation with our, uh, some of the data scientists at our company, and we ended up building a track level model where our PUMA, so our higher level demographic um, estimates were the dependent variable, and then we used track level variables as the explanatory variables. Um, and this was the approach that came up with estimates that were similar to our PUMA level estimates, but still had um, what we thought was a plausible level of variation in a way that we thought would help the Robinhood Foundation better target their outreach. Um, in addition to varying kind of what was the level of granularity that we modeled, we also uh, tested out different algorithm types, so linear, tree-based, ensemble methods, um, whether we applied a transformation to the dependent variable, and then whether we capped the features that went into the model at some proportion of what we observed at the track level. Um, 
So here's an example of some of the diagnostic plots that we made. These are all different representations of Bushwick, um, which was one of the pumas that we thought was a high target uh, for EITC. And we're looking at what is the relative density of non-participation according to our different modeling approaches. Um, and so this one in the bottom right-hand corner was the one that we ultimately selected, which was the tract uh, based tract level model, um, which was you know, it, it had the trade-off of both providing additional variance that we thought was helpful while also not introducing a lot of noise into the problem that would have been distracting. Um, and this is an example of how we communicated that information. So we're looking at Bushwick again, and we flagged particular tracks where we thought there was especially high non-participation, as well as uh, particular you know, stations and social service organizations in those tracks that the Robin Hood Foundation could begin to do outreach to. Um, and, you know, one thing that is kind of reassuring here is you see the bottom right-hand green corner, that's actually a cemetery, so it totally makes sense that we wouldn't see non-participation there. Cool. Um, so to kind of zoom out, we've been talking about EITC, but we've presented results to Robin Hood for both EITC and for SNAP. Um, and this is kind of like how we presented it to them, but what we found was that 89% um, of eligible people uh, received the EITC in 2013, and 76% of eligible, eligible people received SNAP in 2014. Um, we used different years, 2013 and 2014, because that was the participation data that we had available to us from their partner organizations, so we used the corresponding ACS data for those years. Um, but we thought it would give a good idea of like the trends of participation there. So we expected more people who were eligible to take advantage of the EITC, and uh, slightly less of people who were eligible for SNAP to take advantage of those benefits. Um, and we have theories on why. <laughs> uh, but the EITC participation gap we found um, was closely associated with an area's economic conditions. So when we ran these models and we did the direct estimates, uh, the variables that we picked up when we were building our model were things like uh, vacant housing units, like uh, availability of public housing. So kind of like uh, some indicators of the economic condition of that area. Um, so we didn't actually find significant differences between different ethnic groups among different neighborhoods. So the areas that we recommended that Robin Hood consist conduct their outreach were just places that had a high density of these non-participating eligible individuals. Um, so we just gave them a rank ordered list of here are the neighborhoods where we think you would have the most impact if you walked up to someone on the street. You have a higher chance of that person being eligible for the EITC but not taking advantage of it. So some of those neighborhoods are highlighted here. Um, the one on the very bottom this one uh, is Staten Island, uh, which is actually was kind of an interesting finding because Staten Island in general is like a higher, uh, has a higher median income than the rest of some of these areas that we've highlighted in New York. Um, but we had a chance to present to some of their partner organizations, so groups that are actually doing this outreach on the ground. Um, and we got some like positive feedback from the folks in Staten Island who were saying like, we actually really want to open up a tax center here. So this like makes sense to us. Um, so we got some good validation there. Um, and when we go to talk about SNAP, we had some slightly more interesting uh, findings. Not more interesting, but there's more to talk about. <laughs> um, and so we found that the participation gap for SNAP was greater in areas with significant ethnic communities um, where English isn't the only language spoken. Um, and so we have some theories there that you know, the eligibility, or sorry, the application process for SNAP is much different than it is for EITC. EITC you do when you fill out your taxes, um, but SNAP is an entirely different process where you have to fill out a separate application. Um, recertification is much more difficult. So we figure there's some sort of language barrier there where the materials that folks need maybe isn't available in their neighborhood in their language. Um, so the areas that we highlighted for them were some areas that had, um, just as with EITC, a high density of non-participating eligibles. Um, so that's the one we've highlighted here in Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, that was actually a target for both neighborhoods. You'll see it's highlighted in both. Um, so in both cases, we found that there was a high concentration of folks who we expected to be eligible but not participating. Um, we also found some um, ethnic communities that we thought would be good targets for outreach. So specifically, we talked to them about plurality Asian communities. Um, so areas where we expect there's a large immigrant population um, and English isn't the only language. Uh, so we highlighted Flushing, Queens as a possible place for them to reach out. Um, so we saw there was above average eligibility uh, in Flushing, but a below average participation rate. And then um, what's happening now? Uh, Robin Hood's actually working right now to roll out a citywide ad campaign and a, like a grassroots um, canvassing campaign to drive enrollment in these programs. So they have folks who are actually standing out with clipboards and talking to people and telling them about the program to get them involved, um, to figure out if they're eligible and if they are, help them to enroll. 
Um, and they're also doing this uh, ad campaign, which is called Start By Asking. And so that's trying to figure out if folks are eligible uh, for benefits and then kind of kickstarting that process where they help them to apply. Um, so what we hope to do with our work was show them places where their ads and their outreach could be the most helpful. Um, and we also wanted to provide them with recommendations for in the future as they're doing this work, as their partners are doing work on the ground, um, what kind of data they could collect uh, to help kind of improve these processes going forward to get a better understanding of who is or isn't enrolling in benefits programs. Yeah, and so that's where we are now. Those are all of our prepared materials. <laughs> I think we have time for questions. Awesome. Thank you very much. Your model looked really cool. Um, I just had a quick question about the track-specific mo model. Could, uh, could you clarify again, like how you, uh, where you, how you obtained a control, a, a control set or like a training set for that? Since you mentioned that your data set didn't cover uh, tracks. <laughs> I'm super excited because for the first time we have this appendix slide uh, set of slides on a track model. Um, so yeah, so the appendix on the track model. So we start with our Puma level estimates. So each square on this slide is a Puma. And you can think of the Pumas that are redder as being Pumas that have a higher target density and the green ones as being a lower target density. We segment these Pumas into tracts. And now the dependent variable for each tract is um, the target density in that tract's Puma. When you train a model on this, you get two sets of things, right? You have the inputs that are going in right now and then you have the model outputs or the fitted values from the model, which are the model's estimates for that area. So the short of it is we take the fitted values, and what that means is our model is searching for rules that define differences between these high density areas and low, low target areas. So if you take a sample tract in one of the high density areas, and it looks a lot like a lot of the tracts in the low density areas, the fitted value or the adjusted value for that tract will be lower. So this isn't so much a training and test set question as a can we adjust our direct estimates based on characteristics of the estimates overall. Uh, first, excellent project. Uh, this is something that could be valuable in a lot of cities, including the city of Chicago and others. One of the challenges with ACS data is that, uh, well, first let me ask, did you guys use uh, one, three, or five year? One year. Yeah, one year estimates. Oh, you did one-year estimates. All right, so maybe this, this will, I think, uh, lessen the importance of this question. What, it's going to be a two-fold question. What is your sort of range of standard error? Do you see a lot of variation between one spot and the other? And the second one is, to what extent are you able to validate uh, the notion that my estimates might actually align to reality? Uh, uh, is there on-the-field testing or anything else that you get a feedback of, like, okay, this, this is a place that's underserved? Sure, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, just for your second question about uh, collecting data from the field, that's something that we uh, worked with the Robin Hood Foundation to kind of brainstorm some ideas. So like, can they be collecting data about people who come into their centers? Can they be working with their partner organizations to kind of validate our expected estimates of how many people in that neighborhood should be coming into um, a particular you know, beneficiary? Uh, but it is a really hard problem, and I think this is something that you know, a lot of folks here probably work in social service delivery, and it's tough to get those accurate counts, especially with these vulnerable populations. Um, and so short of something like an RCT or, you know, using observational data creatively, I think that's an area that we're continuing to, to do research and explore. Yeah. And then in terms of the precision of these estimates, um, we, have a, we have an idea as to how to get standard errors for the first step, as in the direct step. We're not sure how to move that standard error through the model. Uh, so we, one, of the, one of the ways that we handle sort of the uncertainty with these estimates is when we go back to, say, the tract um, predictions that we delivered, uh, we identify not just, uh, like, let's say, not just specific tracts, but also places within those tracts that might be high traffic areas like public schools or libraries, where even if we're, you know, off within this tract, we think that other people within the tract might still go through those areas. Um, so that's something that we're currently dealing with more on the practical recommendation and strategy side as opposed to on the modeling side, but it's something we're thinking about on the modeling side too. Uh, something that stuck out to me, you mentioned when you were looking at SNAP participation and how there were different ethnic groups and you hypothesized that language might be a barrier, and I'm just wondering if that was 
if you had any other indication why it would be specifically language, not anything else such as uh, maybe just uh, lifestyle or time or trust of the government or whether or not, along with the field validation, if, if we could just survey people in that neighborhood and ask them why they don't participate in SNAP. Yeah, we were thinking language because one of the variables we looked at was percent of other languages that were spoken. Um, so uh, kind of like looking at areas where English wasn't primary and that was a variable that we, I think we ended up including um, in our model. So it was one of the reasons we were like looking at language. Um, another thing we talked a little bit about, but I don't know if we ever kind of really landed on anything was um, citizenship status. Um, so that affects eligibility for some of these programs. Um, but you know, it's not a thing that we could really measure. So we knew areas that had like a large immigrant population. And so we knew that could affect whether one actually enrolled or not. Um, we still kind of highlighted these as target areas, but with the caveat of the eligibility there is a little bit harder to suss out. Yeah, and to your point about culture, I think that came up a little bit when we met with some of the partners on the ground that um, you know different cultural norms might affect how willing someone is to step forward and get involved in these benefits. To your point about survey research, I think that's a lot trickier, particularly in these communities where you know folks might not be documented or where there's just general concern about participating in this kind of work. Um, you know, surveying these populations is really challenging, and I think has a lot of ethical complications involved. And so that's part of the reason why we chose to do this public data-driven approach rather than actually collect individual level responses, um, both just the feasibility and a lot of the other issues involved. So in uh, one of your earlier slides, you showed uh, that the lower income bracket had especially high variance and uncertainty. Um, was there any special consideration you paid to uh, make sure that this uh, increased uncertainty in the lower income bracket wouldn't lead to any kind of systemic uh, biases in your final recommendation? Yeah. So, we so what we what I've plotted here is the the state by state estimates. So this is overall. I'm I want to say New York was closer to the mean than the typical state. So I think that was the first layer. Um, where we think we're doing not as poorly in New York as in, in, as in, in some other states. Um, we didn't do anything particular to take into account that information, apart from relying generally on modeling to, to pull estimates back in towards the mean if they're, if they're um, more extreme. We, so we relied fairly heavily on modeling, I guess, on the modeling step to account for any errors we were making here. And we also tested our definition of adjusted gross income in several ways to try and make that bottom income bracket as accurate as possible. So this was sort of what we're already plotting here is sort of the is the result of a series of steps we had taken, where initially we had a, a more biased me measure of adjusted gross income. And this is sort of a less biased version than we started with. And the other thing that we do know is we think, so one of the things that we do say is because we think the income estimates are noisier in the bottom income bracket, we also think we might be slightly under or overestimating participation or underestimating the size of the gap. So one of the things that we passed on to Robin Hood was the idea that the, our 89% number in New York City might be high. We don't think it's going to be especially high. I think New York State average participation is 83%. So we're willing to believe that New York City's participation at 89% is not unreasonable, but really it might be something like 87% or something like that. So we did give you know, like a qualitative answer back to Robin Hood, um, but that's not something we were able to quantitatively um, figure out. And also, um, since we were estimating whether someone was eligible or not, and not necessarily the amount of benefit they were going to receive, um, I think we were okay with a little bit more uncertainty because we were like willing to say this person is eligible if they fall in this area or something like that, but we didn't have to give an exact figure of this is how much we expect them to get in benefits. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, so actually my question is probably related to ACS, which is where you have, for example, heavy tail, heavy tail distribution within that 100,000 user geographic area, because it seems like uh, they're gonna have a little bit of a bias, sort of a geographic bias because of the way that they uh, sp split up their data. So how do you know, for example, you're not going to have some sort of mismodeling in an area that might appear to have high income because there's two or three multi-billionaire people that live there skewing the results of a low-income area? I can take that. You want to take it? Okay. Yeah. So if I'm understanding the question right, yeah, there could be systematic geographic differences 
between geographies in the ACS. Uh, that's going to be a problem if those ge I think that's going to be a problem if that is characteristic of all of New York City. If it's instead the case that in some places in New York City we have problems with our estimates, but in general we trust the validity in New York City overall, building a model to adjust outliers, outlier direct estimates should account for that. That is, if, like, if our highest target uh, Puma up here is a place where we're generating a very high estimate because the ACS data is bad, but we have characteristics added to this file, like percentage of people living in high rises, which I don't know if we had, but things like vacant housing stock, things like um, data from our consumer file, and other data that we've curated as a, as a company overall, we should be able to pick up on biases in the ACS as long as those biases aren't there in our other data sources. So we're trusting modeling here again a little bit. Yeah. And I would also add that the ACS includes a person weight field. So for each individual response that we use, there was a weight assigned with that person so that when we rolled it up to the Puma level, we had like an accurate measure of the population as a whole. Um, so if there was someone in, that, uh, in a certain Puma who maybe isn't representative of the Puma overall, we would hope that that ACS weight would account for not taking that person to be representative of the whole geographic area. You spoke during the presentation about different pieces of information that you delivered to the client as well as different recommendations. And one of the major questions with different data science firms is where do you lie along the line between delivering bare information from your models and delivering recommendations for action. So I guess speaking more generally beyond the scope of this project, where does Civis, or the applied team I should say in Civis, usually find itself along that scale from information to recommendations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends a little bit on where the client comes into you. So like kind of the level that they're at and like at what, you know, what teams and what capability they have to use kind of raw data if you were to deliver it to them. Um, so Robinhood's working with uh, another firm that's going to be like that is using software and it's on the ground and is measuring actual field contacts. Um, so they wanted to use a lot of these actual literal numbers of like our estimated participation rates in these areas. So they were delivered like a file of those things as well as we did a bunch of presentations and readouts to kind of like the management the management team there and their partner organizations. And that was less giving them kind of the raw file and telling them more about here's your target hotspots. Here's why we think that is. And then maybe the numbers we would include would be those citywide 79 and 83 percent, or that's not right, <laughs> those numbers. Um, <laughs> um, so it's a little bit about like where the client comes to you. And also, it's, a, it's like about how confident we are in what we're actually providing. So with the Puma level estimates, we felt comfortable giving them like, here's your estimates of participation rates in these areas. With the track level estimate, because of this process, and so since there was a little bit more noise and it was harder to validate, um, we kind of presented those results as, you know, well, one, here are all the things we're not totally sure about, and here's the approach we took. And, you know, here is relative to the Puma, which areas we think are going to be targets for you. So we presented that as a difference from the Puma overall, but we didn't give them, like, a raw number for each tract, just because those weren't numbers we felt we could validate and be super confident in, but we could tell them a general trend of, you know, here's where we think within this neighborhood you should focus. Um, so I guess to summarize, um, my answer is it's kind of like for the applied team generally, uh, we try to present things that are going to be useful to our client like as we deliver them. So we don't want to give them a raw data file if they can't use it. Um, and two, we want to make sure that we're totally confident in the stuff that we're giving them. So we don't want to give them numbers we think are wrong. Um, we want to give them kind of like our understanding of the most accurate picture of the neighborhoods they're working in. All right, well, I think that's all we have time for. So thank you very much.